Um, I'll give you guys a bit about 21 Acres. So for those who don't know, 21 Acres is a living laboratory that serves to educate our communities around climate change and how to participate in climate action by promoting and building resilient food systems that are rooted in agroecology, regenerative farming, sustainable land stewardship, and as you will see, adopting sustainable living and building practices. 21 Acres is located in Woodenville, Washington on the ancestral lands of indigenous nations, including the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples. And we acknowledge these nations as the original stewards of this land and honor both the land itself and the Coast Salish people past and present. And it's really an honor to continue stewarding this land. So that's a bit about us. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Barry, our tour guide, and Kelly, our, our video <laughs> person, and we will uh, do the tour. <laughs> thanks All right. for being the yeah. Chat. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. Um, and Rianne gave a yeah, basic rundown of our uh, mission and what we do here, um, but I'll try to, Mostly we'll be talking about the building here today, um, but just to kind of give a little bit more context. Um, so as Rianne said, our mission is to um, kind of uplift and support um, agroecological practices like sustainable agriculture, um, restoration, um, and then green building as well and local food systems. And to kind of promote all of those as climate solutions. Um, so kind of putting everything in the context of climate change and um, yeah, starting from that place. Uh, and just for kind of like a physical overview, um, we have, we are actually sitting on uh, 21 acres of land here at the top of the agricultural production district in Woodenville, which is about um, 1100 acres of uh, preserved farmland, which is really important, very close to the city. Um, and we've been here, uh, we've been open since 2011, uh, but the project got going in the, um, a lot of the thinking about it got going in the late 90s and um, early aughts. And then we were actually able to open in 2011. Um, so that's a little bit of the history. Uh, and in terms of climate context and the importance of green building, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, um, just like to note that globally, um, Building, the building industry uh, and related energy use uh, account for about 40% of global emissions. So anything that we can do um, to reduce the impact of buildings is going to have a pretty significant impact globally. Uh, and that's, that's part of why we focus on that here. Um, and then also thinking about not only the environmental implications of climate change, which um, most folks are familiar with, but also the social impacts. Um, and thinking about it from a kind of a social justice lens or climate justice lens that uh, a lot of the folks globally who are least responsible for climate emissions tend to have the biggest impacts. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of great work being done in climate justice work uh, globally and uh, nationally and locally. Uh, if you have more interest in that, happy to point you into some, some good resources. Um, but without further ado, we'll start talking about our building here. So um, we are a LEED Platinum certified building. This is our plaque behind me here. Um, and just to give a little overview of LEED, uh, it stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And it's the Green Building um, Certification Program of the US Green Building Council. Um, and probably the most widely adopted green building certification um, in this country, maybe globally, but one of the most well-known for sure. Uh, and I think some of the benefits of LEED are that it really has brought a lot of people into green building because uh, it's made it sort of accessible. And there's a lot of ways that you can get points. So essentially uh, different green features on a building get you points. So having a solar array, it's kind of an, a more obvious one, really good insulation, um, energy uh, efficient equipment. Um, so things that are maybe a little more come to mind when you think about green building more obviously, but then also something like being close to public transit, uh, walkability access um, to bike trails and things like that. Uh, there's actually a bike trail that runs right behind our property here and we have a bike rack here and there's a 
having a shower so that employees can bike to work and be able to have a professional appearance when they start their day. Um, so you can get points for all these things that you might not consider um, just intuitively. And as well, um, you can get points for site prep using recycled materials. So there's a whole long list, uh, water features. And most of the things that I'll be talking about in our building were things that we got points for. Um, and I'll try and leave it at that here. So we keep moving, but are there any, uh, any general questions at this point about our mission or lead? Okay. All right. Oh. Oh no, I was just gonna say, feel free to chime in if you'd like, and you can also use the chat. Yeah, okay. Um, well, before we uh, head out and take a look at the um, outside of the building and some of the features out there, I always like to take a look at our energy use um, through our energy monitoring system, which is called eGauge. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll come down here. So you can kind of see. So um, this is our overall energy use. This display, the um, red line at the top here is the building energy use. Uh, the green line down here, it's been pretty cloudy lately, but that's our solar production. Uh, in the summertime, it's like way up here. Um, but that white space down at the bottom represents how much the solar is offsetting. Uh, but the really cool thing about this system is that we actually have um, sub-metering throughout our electrical panel on uh, most of the major circuits in the building. So that's what all these little buttons down here are. And I have a couple clicked. So our, um, we have a ground source heat pump um, for our hot water and also for our um, building heating. And uh, I've clicked on both of those because those are some of the biggest um, users, even though they're incredibly efficient systems. Uh, so you can see these dotted lines. This represents our hot water heating. Uh, so you, it comes on periodically. Kelly, do you mind zooming in a little bit closer on the, the details of the screen? Thank you. Oh, thanks, Rianne. Sorry if you couldn't see that well. Um, but yeah, these, these lines here are the um, hot water heat pump coming on. And you can see that correlating to the line, the big line here at the top. Um, so where our big energy use goes up, you can see that there. And then over here, this wider one, this is the heat pump that does our space heating. Um, so it doesn't come on overnight because we have the, the temperature set lower, but in the morning it's heating up the building a little bit uh, this time of year. So you can kind of see those correlations there. And then there's other things like um, lighting. Uh, where's a good one? So you can see our parking lot lights. Actually, those are LEDs, so you, they don't even show up because they use so little light. Um, but you can see some exterior lights around the building coming on at night. Uh, those are on photo sensors, but, um, oh wait, no, upper west. Sorry, that's inside the building, my bad. <laughs> that's why they're coming on during the day. Um, but then at night they don't come on because they are also on photo sensors. And we'll talk a little bit more about lighting and those things. Um, but, yeah, I just wanted to sort of contextualize this with uh, at-home systems. Um, so there's some really cool uh, affordable ways of doing energy monitoring at home, at least for um, plug loads. You know, one of the original things is a kilowatt meter, which is just a little device you can plug in and see how much energy different devices in your house are using. Um, but now with um, things like smart speakers and like Alexa and uh, those kinds of things, the smart plugs that you use to have like Alexa turn your lights on or off can actually also do energy monitoring and they're really affordable. You can get those for like a few bucks on the internet uh, and they can come with an app for your phone so you can monitor how much energy different, like a mul multiple different plugs are using in your house. Um, and then if you wanted to have like a full building system, uh, if you were having any electrical work done in your panel, um, you could, that might be a good opportunity to have an electrician install a full building system if you're interested in that kind of thing. And some of those for household use are, are relatively affordable. And this system we actually retrofitted into our, our panel um, and is relatively affordable, um, but has a lot of, because we are a commercial building, we have a lot of circuits. So um, probably wouldn't need quite that many for household use. 
But anyway, it's a little bit about energy monitoring. And one of the big benefits of that is that it allows us to see specifically where we're using the most energy in the building and then find strategies for reducing those things uh, and highlight areas. Um, so we look at it on a quarterly basis, at least, if not more, uh, to see if there's things that we need to adjust. So without further ado, um, I think we'll head outside and while we're walking. There is a um, question from the chat about- um, Oh, okay. Bobby's. Um, yeah, please. What, or Bobby's asking, what do the large spikes in energy represent? Um, he's assuming it's the water pump, but just curious. Oh yeah, so it's, um, it's the heat pump. So it's not actually pumping water, but it is uh, heating water. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So it's a geothermal heat pump for our hot water in the building. So it's very water related. Um, but yeah, this uh, represents that heat pump. Okay. All of these so, little bumps. So the, it pumps warm water and the warm water creates heat? Um, yeah, so it's it kind of works like the opposite of it. Like if you ever touch the back of a um, air conditioner, it's really hot. Yep. So it's kind of capturing the heat um, from that process. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we head okay. downstairs. Wow. Perfect. But, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really efficient way of heating water um, for heating the building or hot water systems. Um, and there's also air source heat pumps, but we'll get more into that. So yeah, are there any other questions at this point? All right, just gonna head outside. Check out the outside of the building and you get a, maybe a look of the surrounding landscape here. Um, so the tree line that you're looking at right now uh, is all kind of back behind there. We're on the front three acres. Um, and I think we'll start by talking about the roof. So maybe I'll uh, swap places with you, Kelly. It looks so nice out there. It's just so peaceful. Can you see and... the roof well? Yeah, it looks okay. good. Okay, cool. Great. Um, so we've just done a little bit of replanting on the roof, actually. So uh, the front area, you'll notice, it's probably a little hard to see from this angle, um, but that's a living roof. So the, the grass roof that you were talking about, Bobby, earlier, um, it's mostly planted with um, very drought tolerant plants. So we don't have to do much watering, uh, just a, a very small amount. And uh, it has a number of benefits. So it kind of provides some insulation for the building. Um, and then it also allows the water. So it's a permeable surface instead of most roofs, which are impermeable. Um, so the water rushes down and into um, stormwater systems and can kind of create uh, runoff issues and, and flooding and stuff when, it, when you're looking at multiple buildings having impermeable roofs. But when you have a living roof, uh, the water very gradually soaks down through the, um, the roof media, the soil basically, um, and makes its way into the water table much more slowly. Uh, and then it also obviously feeds water to the plants. Uh, and then the plants encourage uh, some wildlife as well. So we actually have geese that nest up here in the springtime um, and kind of yeah, bring more life to the building, help it blend in. And it's also just a nice thing to see. Um, so those are some of the benefits. It can also passively cool the building in the summertime um, through evapotranspiration. Um, and then behind the living roof, you'll notice some solar panels. Um, so that's the, the solar array that we're picking up a little bit of on E-Gage. Uh, it's pretty cloudy today, so we're not making a lot of energy but it's a 26 kilowatt solar array um, and it produces enough energy to power about three average American homes. Um, and for our building, cause we're a fairly uh, large, you know, moderate size commercial building and we have a market which uses a lot of refrigeration. Um, we also have an education kitchen, which has a lot of appliances. It covers about, um, like 10 to 15% of our energy use over the course of the year. Um, but in the summertime, because we get so much solar, we're actually sending energy back to the grid on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, 
Any uh, questions about the living roof or solar at this point? Okay, I will continue on then. Uh, so while we're talking about solar um, and the roof, I'm gonna talk a little bit about passive solar design here. Um, and can you see this side of the wall here in the camera? So you notice we have uh, windows on the south side of the building, which is important for passive solar. So we want to collect that solar heat in the summertime, um, but not be, sorry, in the wintertime, but not be collecting it in the summertime uh, so that we can heat the building passively. Uh, and so this uh, roof overhang here at the top, just above the windows is specifically designed so that uh, this time of year, as we're transitioning into winter, um, around midday, you can actually see the shadow from the roof overhang is above these windows. So we're getting as much solar gain into the building as we can. Um, someone coming up the stairs. I'll maybe move back just a little bit. Um, hello, welcome, filming our building tour. Um, maybe step back over here so we can see. Oh, we lost signal. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I think that basically covers the passive solar design. So we're having a little bit of um, signal difficulty here. Uh, but this, this overhang is also designed to hold a um, vine so that the plants will leaf out in the summertime and help shade the windows. Um, and the shadow in the summertime is actually at the bottom of the windows or all the way at the bottom of the wall um, in the height of the summer at noon. So we get as little energy into the building as possible to keep it cool. Um, and another thing that helps keep it cool is the actual wall material itself. Um, and I can show you a sample of that when we head back inside, but it's made out of what are called insulated concrete forms, um, which have about two inches of recycled styrofoam insulation on the inside and two inches on the outside. And then the concrete gets poured in the middle. So you can kind of uh, build a building out of these styrofoam blocks that almost look like Legos, uh, and then pour the concrete directly into them uh, without having to build um, concrete, other uh, concrete forms. Uh, and they have little holders for rebar. I'll show you an example, like I said, when we come in. Um, that helps avoid heat transfer to the walls and the building more efficient. Um, and we also have some solar shades that we use in the summertime, and uh, we still have them up for folks working in the front because the sun can be kind of intense even this time of year. Um, but they're very opaque looking from the outside. Um, but when you're inside looking out, you can see through it quite well. Um, and it's important to have solar shades on the outside of the building so that heat you keep the heat uh, in the summertime from entering in the first place. If the shades are on the inside, you're still creating kind of a greenhouse effect on the inside of that window. Um, so yeah, that covers uh, a lot of the solar features. Um, so maybe now we can talk a little bit about water. Uh, I did mention the benefits of the living roof in terms of water, um, but there's another important feature throughout the site and that you'll notice where I'm standing right now is actually um, not a concrete patio, but uh, it's made of permeable pavers. So there's little cracks in between all the pavers where the water can go. Uh, and that's really important for storm water, just like the living roof. So that water kind of gradually percolates back into the water table instead of um, overwhelming storm water systems or creating erosion or runoff. Um, and our entire parking lot is also paved with permeable pavers. And we can show you that uh, when we head downstairs a little bit, you can see it a little from here, maybe that kind of grid pattern. Um, and the only surfaces that are paved are ones that basically structurally have to be. So um, this inner patio area is actually a roof of the building, the stairs and the sidewalk, uh, things that kind of need to be a consistent surface. But everything that could be paved with permeable pavers was. Um, and in addition to that, um, maybe if we could take a look from over here. Um, do you lose Wi-Fi if you come? Okay, 
or maybe we could take a look at the bioswale um, from this side. So surrounding the front three acres of the building um, is a bioswale, which is kind of a low lying um, area that's kind of on the edge of the parking lot there. Um, and that shed structure sort of in the middle, it goes under that and then continues all the way back towards a wetland restoration project, which is behind the tree line there. Um, and then down behind that tent, there's a rain garden and there's another rain garden in the front. And so the bioswales are designed to capture rainwater that comes off of the parking lot um, and direct it back towards the wetland and towards these rain gardens that have a lot of water loving plants um, planted in there that can actually take up um, any contaminants that get into the water from the parking lot. Um, even things like heavy metals, they can kind of transfer into their biomass. Um, and pull it out of the water at least. So uh, that's a great ecosystem service that's provided by those plants. Um, and the reason that we have these bioswales, which are also planted with water loving plants uh, and the rain gardens as well. So um, those are some important water features, um, but actually probably the single biggest way that we um, conserve water, not related to rainwater, but um, building water, is the fact that we have composting toilets. Uh, and we'll go down there and talk to you a little bit more about composting toilets, but it accounts for about um, our building compared to a conventional commercial building of this size uses about 80% less water, which is mostly because of our composting toilets. Uh, but we also have um, water saving fixtures um, throughout the building and a shower. And, um, you might be able to hear a very low hum happening, um, but probably not from over there. Uh, but I will just mention that all of our wastewater treatment from the building um, is processed right here on site um, in a system that's buried in our hillside over here. Uh, and because of some uh, service issues, it would be a little bit hard probably for Kelly to get over there with the camera. Um, but there's a series of tanks that are buried under the hillside uh, that process all of the wastewater from the building. So uh, anything that goes down the sinks um, and all the effluent from the composting toilets gets pumped and uh, the black water and processed in that system. And it's a two stage uh, process. There's an anaerobic stage first where there's no oxygen and bacteria that thrive in that environment, um, help break down any uh, pathogens in the water. And then there's an aerobic stage and that's the sound. If you're standing here, you can hear there's uh, some blowers pumping air into the tanks um, and the bacteria that thrive in an oxygen rich environment are doing a, a secondary stage of the cleanup. And then finally, everything is kind of gravity fed down from the hillside um, into these Clendon bio mounds, which are on the farm. And they're kind of, um, yeah, it just looks like a series of mounds, uh, but they're basically sandboxes um, and they have some grass growing on top and the water kind of percolates up through the sand and makes its way out into the water table on the farm. And that's the final stage. Um, but even after it goes through the process on the hillside, uh, it's always tested. And we're told that it's some of the cleanest water that they test even before it goes to the, the biofilters on the farm. Um, so yeah, that covers a lot of water related things here. Are there any questions at this point? Yes, we have questions, um, not related to water right now, but if anyone um, comes up with questions about uh, water, definitely yeah, chime anything. in. So we, or, or anything, literally, yeah. Um, uh, hey Young asks, do, do you have um, solar thermal collectors or only PV panels? Uh, we don't have any solar thermal currently. Um, we, we did do a kind of interesting um, uh, livestock uh, watering tank that has a passive solar thermal um, uh, project with some students a couple years back, but we don't have any uh, solar thermal array on the building at this point, no. Thank you. And um, I don't wanna mispronounce your name. I'm just gonna try. 
or, or if you'd like to, you could ask as well, but um, Ayotunde, I hope I'm not butchering your name. Um, Ayotunde asks, how many square feet is the building? Uh, it's just over 12,000 square feet. Yeah. Nice job, yeah. Becca. Becca's, Becca's also here um, in the chat and <laughs> was able to come in with the answer. <laughs> Hi, Becca. <laughs> um, I also Thank want to you. share, it's 11.32. And okay. when we did our run through this morning, the Wi-Fi worked really well for Kelly's video. But right now, it looks like um, Van Gogh. It's very swirly. Oh, OK. <laughs> I don't know if it's uh, when we have a lot of people on the call, maybe that's what it what happens. Well, let's try. Yeah, th that might be part of it. Um, well, I think we're going to transition to back into the building at this point. Oh, um, okay. So if there's if there's more questions in the chat, I'm happy to cover those, but I'll start moving and we'll see if the Wi-Fi gets better as we go inside. Are you on Wi-Fi, Kelly? Kelly is on Wi-Fi. Yep. Okay. Well. Thank you everyone for your your um, patience with the the camera. Sometimes it just like it just gets real blurry. <laughs> yeah. How are we uh, are we still blurry? A little Should bit, I... but it it's getting better. Okay. All right. So we're heading back into the building to look at some of our lighting features. Um, turn on the lights, but they're not coming on because of the solar sensors um how are we doing on on video now oh way way better <laughs> okay great yeah this is a good um good portion to have good video for um so you notice i just hit the light switches uh, for our lighting in here but they didn't come on uh, which is because we have photo sensors um, which help control the lighting so there's actually two, two sets of sensors in here. Um, there's a photo sensor, which is up along this beam. You probably won't be able to see it too well because it's pretty small. Um, but it senses light coming into the building uh, and turns off the lights if there is enough daylighting in here. But there's uh, another sen set of sensors. There's one up in this corner here, a motion sensor, and one up in the other corner. So as long as there's people in the room working, it'll keep the lights on, but if there's no one in here or no movement detected for a while, um, it'll turn the lights off. Oh, so actually, I guess it was the motion sensors that were keeping the lights off. So they just detected me uh, or Kelly and turned the lights on. I thought it was a little dim for the photo sensor to be turning the light off, but anyway, that's a demonstration of the motion sensors working. Uh, so once we leave the room after a certain period of time, uh, they'll turn the lights off automatically so we don't have to remember to do that. Um, but a lot of um, the electricity use in commercial buildings comes from lighting. Um, so doing daylighting and having a lot of light come into the building that way uh, can be a great way to save energy. Um, and so we have clear story windows in this room, which uh, Kelly probably showed when we first got in here. Those are the high, high up windows. Um, they're not, you know, can't physically reach them, but a lot of daylight comes in through those. Um, and then there's also skylights, uh, which are made from a very cool product called CalWall, um, which we have a sample of here. Uh, and this is an insulated um, panel that allows quite a bit of light, as you can see, to come through, um, but is also highly insulated. So uh, the product that they make now um, can get up to a, an R20. So uh, insulation is rated in terms of R value, which is resistance to heat flow. Uh, so the conventional wall of a building, um, like a residential building, is usually around an R20. Uh, that's like a one by six wall with fiberglass insulation. Uh, so to have a um, essentially a skylight panel that can have the same insulating value as the wall of a building, I think is really impressive. Uh, most windows aren't even rated in terms of R value because the R values are so embarrassing. They're like one or two. Um, so R20 is, is significantly higher than that. Um, yeah, so that covers a lot of the um, lighting related issues in the building uh, and some automation with the lighting as well and those panels. Oh, but I did promise to show you a, 
sample of our insulated concrete form walls. So this is what I was talking about, the kind of Lego blocks that our walls are built out of. Um, two inches of recycled styrofoam on the inside, two inches on the outside, and then uh, the rebar and the concrete would get uh, put in between here to make the structure of the building. And uh, just in the construction of this building, um, about 17,000 pounds of styrofoam were kept out of the landfill. So that's a pretty great uh, recycled content. And then uh, styrofoam is pretty lightweight. So, and also um, around 500 yards of concrete uh, were reduced. Uh, so um, this product, but also um, Apex Block, which is another product that was used in the building, has um, styrofoam mixed into the aggregate. So that reduces the amount of cement that you have to use. Uh, and so we're able to save around 500 cubic yards of cement from a conventional poured concrete structure of this size. Yeah. Any, uh, any more questions at this point? Let's see, maybe while we wait, <laughs> I just want to shout out, Kelly, you're doing such a great job filming. I really like how, yeah, you're just doing awesome. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Um, but while we All wait right. for any questions. Well, I'll keep, start walking into the kitchen while we're waiting. Um, and yeah, feel free to speak up at any point, but no pressure. If there's more questions. Uh, we'll be passing by our very energy efficient elevator that's in this space. Um, uses about 70% less energy than a conventional elevator uh, because it runs off of a counterweight. Um, so every time it's coming up, it, it's actually just dropping the counterweight. Uh, it only uses energy when it's going down and lifting the counterweight and also has a very efficient motor. Um, and here we are in our education kitchen. Um, so this is in some ways kind of the, gets to the heart of our mission here um, because local food uh, is all about cooking or you know, consumption of food. Uh, where that all happens is in the kitchen. So we thought it was really important to uh, have that kind of space here. And so we run, um, you know, not during COVID, but uh, cooking classes. Uh, we do some food prep for the market, which we'll also walk through uh, later on. Um, and the focus here is on finding ways of using local ingredients and encouraging people to do that and shop and eat locally. Um, and that that's one of the kind of simplest things that anyone can do to reduce their um, carbon footprint. Um, just by supporting regenerative agriculture uh, and small farms that are doing soil healthy farming practices and actually able to uh, sequester, keep a lot of carbon in the soil and also produce healthy local vegetables and cut down on um, the miles that that food has to travel to get to you as well. I think the average uh, item from an American household travels 1500 miles to get there. So our food can be more well-traveled than we are often, especially during COVID. Um, and some of the focus and the education that happens in here is on uh, finding flavor alternatives that you can get locally. So things like citrus that don't grow up here in the Northwest, uh, replacing those flavors with stuff like um, apple cider vinegar or sumac actually produces a red bud that can make a really delicious uh, like lemonade flavored drink uh, and be used to um, give that tart flavor to a number of other things. Um, and then something as simple as using uh, local honey instead of using sugar uh, that has to be imported uh, for sweetener. And um, yeah, just getting people more familiar with uh, local ingredients and seasonal cooking. But there's also some really cool sustainability features in here. So um, our hood system, uh, which is above the stoves back here, only turns on uh, when there's actually heat happening. 
So when you're actively cooking at the stove here, um, once it gets up to 90 degrees, there's temperature sensors in the hood that turn it on. So it's called demand controlled ventilation. So it only turns on when there's a ventilation demand that's required. Uh, and our whole building ventilation system also runs on the uh, CO2 sensors, which are located throughout the building. I'll try and point one out at some point. Um, so our ventilation system only turns on when there's enough people in the room breathing out enough CO2 that the CO2 levels rise um, to, I think it's around 800 um, parts per million. Once they get that high, then the ventilation kicks on until they drop down below that. Uh, so we're only ventilating for the actual occupancy of the building instead of for uh, maximum occupancy, which is what you'd be required to do if you don't have demand control ventilation. So it can save a huge amount of energy. Uh, and in a commercial kitchen, um, instead of running the fans all day, even when you're not cooking, um, you can just run them when you're actively using it. So that's one way of saving energy. Uh, also having Energy Star appliances, um, so Energy Star sticker here. Um, yeah, things that are certified to be uh, extra energy efficient. We have all, all the appliances that we could get Energy Star certified, we do. Um, we also have a freezer back here, which runs off of propane, uh, which is a much more environmentally friendly uh, refrigerant, has a much lower, almost no, a very minimal greenhouse gas potential compared to other refrigerants. Um, and it's also more efficient and uses less energy. And then last but not least, um, the countertop here is made of a product called Paper Stone, uh, which is a locally produced product here in Washington state. And it's made from recycled paper um, and a hazelnut resin. And it comes in a variety of different colors that are, you can see here. Um, and it's temperature rated up to 350 degrees. So um, most things that you pull out of the oven, you can very quickly put them on the counter uh, without damaging it. Um, and it can also be installed. It can be cut with like a conventional circular saw or things like that. So you wouldn't have to have a um, stone countertop installer to install it. And it's comparable in cost competitive with stone countertops. So that's a very cool product that's made locally. Um, and also the uh, paneling on the front of this um, island here is made from bamboo, which is a rapidly renewable um, product, uh, building product. Bamboo is a fast growing grass. And um, so as soon as it's, uh, you, you don't have to kill it to harvest it. It just keeps growing back. And every time it grows back, it uh, pulls more carbon out of the atmosphere and kind of stores that into the building product. In this case, the paneling. You also commonly see it cutting boards, flooring, a lot of different things made out of bamboo. Um, so yeah, I think that covers um, most of the things I wanna talk about in the kitchen. Any questions while we're in here? No? Okay. We will continue on then um, and take you down to our, see our composting toilets, which is where a lot of the magic happens. My favorite part of the tour. <laughs> it's just funny. Nobody thought we would get to this point probably when they signed up, but you will see. <laughs> it's not, it's not really, it's not gross. Yes, it won't be gross. <laughs> we could, <laughs> we could show you the inside, but you know, I guess on Zoom you wouldn't you wouldn't be exposed to any bad smells. True. Oh, I just cut out. Okay. No, just tell us Okay. Sorry. I think the video has cut out, but I'm still here. And we're making our way down the stairs. Going to show you the composting toilet. Apologies for the video failure. We'll be right back with you momentarily. Yeah, once they get closer to the building, it, it all comes back. Yep. Oh, and this is actually, you can totally see the permeable pavers there when you guys maybe want to walk. Um, is the video back? No, I lied. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could try putting it on mine if you want to see it, but let's just, we'll start with the 
composting toilets and then see how we're doing. Has the video come back? The video is back. It's just a little swirly, but it look it is back. Okay. Um, well, we're gonna roll with it. So here we are in the composter room. Um, and this is where, yeah, everything, all the poop and pee essentially come down from our um, composting toilets upstairs. Uh, and this is part of why we have a two-story building and we only have um, composting toilets on the upstairs because we have a very high water table here. So um, often composting toilets would be installed in a basement space, um, but because the water table is so high, we couldn't have a basement for this building. So we have our uh, toilets just on the second floor. Um, but it's a very simple system. Uh, essentially, this container, uh, this is like the largest container that Clevis Multrum, they're the manufacturers of our composting toilet system, one of the oldest composting toilet companies um, around. Uh, the bottom of the container has a sloped um, surface. So you put uh, wood shavings, a layer of wood shavings on the very bottom when you start. Um, and everything kind of makes its way towards the front. So the um, oldest material would be closest to this hatch, which is where once the material has to be emptied, we would remove it from. Um, and the only maintenance that we really have to do is about once a month, we add an extra layer of wood shavings um, and rake out the material that's fallen here. Um, and other than that, it kind of takes care of itself. And there's uh, bacteria that thrive in this environment and they basically just keep breaking down the material and breaking it down. Um, and having that correct uh, carbon nitrogen mix. So you get a lot of nitrogen from the solids that are coming into here uh, and then carbon from the uh, wood shavings uh, have that right mix to kind of keep that bacteria happy and keep things breaking down. So we've actually never had to empty these since we opened the building in 2011. And they're actually probably full to around here. Um, and they have the same uh, size units at one of the facilities at the Bronx Zoo, which obviously gets a huge amount of foot traffic. Um, and after 10 years, they still hadn't had to empty theirs. So we haven't quite hit the 10 year mark, uh, but we're not anticipating having to empty them uh, very soon just because of how efficiently that bacteria and the worms that live in here keep breaking it down. Uh, one of the most interesting tasks that uh, my former boss, Melissa, uh, who used to be the facilities manager here, um, had to do when she first started working was she was asked to go out on the farm, uh, dig up some red wriggler worms and dump uh, a portion of them into each of the toilets uh, to help start the community of worms. And uh, there's thriving communities of worms now. So yeah, working with those uh, microorganisms, the bacteria and the worms to help make a more sustainable way of having toilets and saving water. Um, and just for a comparison, so a conventional toilet uses uh, I guess you could sort of average it out to two gallons. Some of the older ones use about three gallons. So this is two gallons here. And our um, composting toilets use a foam flushing agent that uses about three ounces of water. So that's this, this low line on this cup here. Um, so it's substantially less. It's about 95% reduction, 95 to 98% reduction in water use per flush. Um, and that's how we get all that water savings. Other than that, um, there are some high efficiency fans that pull any bad smells out and exhaust them out the roof. So nothing, no bad smells come up through the toilets. Um, and a, a little bit of water is added periodically just to keep the moisture level so that the um, worms and bacteria are happy. But other than that, it just takes care of itself. Questions about composting toilets? Yes. Hey, Young asks So, is the tank for anaerobic digestion, then composting with air happens outside? Um, no, it's actually uh, an aerobic process within the tank itself. So, there's no um, anaerobic process happening. Um, a lot of what I uh, 
studied and worked on with Hey Young was related to anaerobic digestion. Uh, and I love to get that going. We're actually getting a home biogas system, which it, it does that out on the farm pretty soon. Uh, but this is just an aerobic process. Uh, so the wood shavings help to allow air to get into the material. Um, yeah. Thank you, Heya. That's yeah. so cool. You guys have a really awesome um, background. I mean, this is this is definitely your your field of expertise. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, oh. I missed the mark in telling you, but we're at um, eleven fifty three. Oh, okay. All right. Well, let's keep moving then. Um, we want to do a quick walkthrough of the market and then take you back to um, the mechanical room, and hopefully, we'll maintain video. Are we still good? Yes. A little bit. You We're look still okay. Yeah, yeah, you guys look good. Hopefully, um, I'll I'll um, let you know if the market we can't see anything, but it's a cool feature, of course. It's one of our biggest attractors. We have it. Frozen right now, but as you make your way into the building, hopefully it'll pick back up. Okay, we'll see. Here's the market. <laughs> okay. So lots of wonderful local produce here. And uh, this is Mary, our market connoisseur. And yeah, just keep on making our way through. Hi, Hello. Crystal. Crystal, other market connoisseur. <laughs> Got lots of wonderful local veggies and local products of all kinds. Hard to hear you right now. Hmm. Shoot. <laughs> this portion of the tour through our walkthrough looked really good, but I guess. Okay. Oh, you're back. Oh, I hear are you. we back? I hear you now. <laughs> do, you, do we have video? Yep, and we see you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello again. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll maintain video into the mechanical room here. Um, but I was just saying that one of the silver linings of COVID is that there's kind of a renewed community interest in um, local food and people growing their own food as well. Um, but the market has actually been doing quite well um, and helping to support local farms that way. So um, here we are in the mechanical room. Um, and I like to note it's like a relatively quiet mechanical room because we don't really, we only have one combustion appliance and it's just a backup hot water heater. Um, but most of our heating is done through a ground source heat pump or a geothermal heat pump, which we were talking about earlier. Uh, and this little diagram, um, so this kind of illustrates the process of how um, the sun's heat is absorbed by the earth. Uh, and that helps the earth maintain around a 55 degree Fahrenheit temperature um, all year round. And geothermal systems work by capturing that heat that the sun puts into the ground uh, and bringing it into a building to use for um, heating the floors. In our case, we have radiant floor heating system um, and then also heating hot water. So that heat that's captured from the earth um, gets routed if you look up to this picture here. So there's tubes that are buried under the earth about five feet underground. In our case, uh, we have about 3,000 feet of PEX um, tubing that's buried. And the heat transfer fluid gets pumped through it. And then it goes into the heat pump, um, which I can show you our heat pump here, um, which just looks like a big metal box. But there's a refrigerant compressor in there, which, um, like I was saying, you know, on the, on the front side of an air conditioner, you're getting cool air coming on these cold coils, but on the backside, there's a lot of heat building up. And so a heat pump kind of works 
as the opposite of an air conditioner. So if you turned your air conditioner around and put the hot side in your house, that's essentially how a heat pump does its heating. Uh, and in this case, that heat is put into um, the heat transfer fluid that goes into our floors. So um, we capture that 55 degree temperature from the earth, which doesn't sound super warm, obviously, uh, but in the winter time, it's a lot warmer than the air temperature. And every time it circulates through those tubes, uh, it picks up a little more heat and a little more heat and a little more heat, and that really adds up. Uh, and that, that water is preheated and then um, brought up to 90 degrees by this, this heat pump here for doing our space heating. And then there's a smaller heat pump behind that that does the hot water and brings it up to 120. Um, and to kind of illustrate the efficiency of this system, uh, most ground source heat pumps have um, a coefficient of performance. So that's the amount, it's the ratio of the amount of energy that you put into it compared to the amount of energy that you get out. So um, for a conventional um, like gas furnace, if you had a really efficient gas furnace for every one unit of energy that you put into it, you could probably get like 0.9 units out um, and a little bit is lost in that heating process. But with a ground source heat pump, because you're capturing that heat from the earth and it's also a very efficient heating process, you can actually, for every unit of energy you put into it, you can get three and a half units out, uh, which is really remarkable and a huge um, increase in efficiency. So that's, that's the big kind of benefit of geothermal heating. Um, and yeah, so you're kind of pulling heat from underground, running it through this heat pump and then putting it under our feet in the building. Um, and these kinds of heat, heating systems can be a little expensive to install, um, but there's a, a more accessible version, which is an air source heat pump, which you commonly see, uh, looks kind of like an air conditioning unit outside a building, but it's separate from the building. Um, and those capture residual heat from the air and do a similar system to this. Um, not quite as efficient as a ground source heat pump, but still very efficient. Uh, and while we're talking about this, I just want to show you the ground loop pipes as well so you kind of illustrate. Um, so these two pipes here come from the heat pump, go up to the ceiling there, and then make their way out um, through that exterior wall there down into the hillside and are buried about five feet underground. Um, so yeah, are there any questions about geothermal ground source heating while we're in here? Thank you. Um, I also want to mention it is, it just struck 12 o'clock. So if, okay. folks, if folks are comfortable waiting a little more for, for extra questions, then um, please, by all means, stay. Um, yeah, and we do thanks have for oh. bearing with us. <laughs> and uh, yeah, questions. Yes, there is one from Hey Young. How many wells do you guys um, so our geothermal system actually isn't a well system. It was trenched um, at the beginning of the project. So it was just a, a kind of a broad trench that's about five feet deep. And all of the coils were buried around five feet. So instead of drilling um, multiple trenches, which is um, commonly also done with geothermal, ours are just buried at five feet. Awesome. Yeah. I learn more and more each time I witness your tour and I'm glad yes. to have, you know, a young here and, and other people who are really understand this, um, the industrial aspect and the, the architecture and all the science that goes into it. It's, it's quite fascinating. Yeah, totally. Um, and I was also recently uh, watching a YouTube video from this old house uh, where they showed an, some new drilling technologies that are actually making um, geothermal a lot more affordable and accessible um, and some different financing options that are similar to solar, which allow people to install a system without having to pay all the upfront cost right away. So hopefully geothermal becomes uh, more prevalent with those 
things. Any other questions about geothermal? Um, we have another question about um, just or kind anything. of like a, a whole systems picture. Um, Aotunde, I, thank you so much for joining. So uh, they're saying, don't mind my question. I'm still in ninth grade, <laughs> but I'm so glad you're here joining <laughs> awesome. us. You're the yeah. coolest ninth grader I've ever met. Um, what is the main purpose of a greenhouse besides helping the environment? Um, so I'm interpreting that as a green green building as opposed to like a greenhouse like on a farm. Um, um, yes, like a green green building, like a home. Yeah. Um, so the main benefit other than benefiting the environment, is that the question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, so there's there's uh, human health benefits as well. Um, if you have if you're using so a lot of the paints, for instance, and the finishes in our building are low VOC. So there's not a lot of uh, what are called volatile organic compounds or essentially toxins that off gas from the materials in the building. Um, so that keeps people, building occupants healthier. Um, also things like having a lot of daylighting, uh, having a more comfortable um, heating system, uh, help people to be happier and more productive when they're in a space. Um, and there's actually been some studies that show like increased productivity um, with daylighting in buildings. Um, and yeah, having uh, demand controlled ventilation systems allows you to kind of adapt your um, ventilation for maximum health. So you can, if you wanna have a more controlled ventilation or um, you know, higher ventilation based on the amount of people in a building, um, you can make those kinds of adjustments. And then, I mean, there's also kind of additional benefits to the environmental thing. So when we're benefiting the environment, it's also benefiting um, people, obviously, by kind of offsetting climate change and things along those lines. Um, that would be my answer. Do you have anything to add, Rianne? I would say like, yeah, the biggest other aspect is is literally just human health because we're a part of the ecosystem and we're also a part of the, um, we can be benefiting from um, more natural systems or technology that uses natural systems um, versus forcing forcing um, unnatural systems like kind of like how the elevator is using gravity we use a less electricity that way and the electricity feeds into the bigger um, surrounding environment like our in Seattle or I guess in in Washington we have hydroelectric power um, but some places would have to use coal and rely on shale and other types of electricity um, generation so if we're able to use less power and we're able to use systems that maximize our natural earth's natural um, capacity to regulate then it, it just kind of benefits us we have better soil we get better water quality for all of our marine environments and all of this relates to better oxygen and lower um less carbon emissions in in the air which which have seen you know damaging effects and um yeah you've yeah. You guys have that, really great questions. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that also, uh, when you were talking about electricity, reminded me of just cost savings as well. Literally, so, um, Trey Young said yeah. that too in the chat. <laughs> just yeah. now. Thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, so if your building's more energy efficient, there's gonna be cost benefits to that as well. You're gonna have lower energy bills um, and the cost of maintaining the building um, and the use of the building will be lower. Yeah. So. Such yeah, a, great a great question. Like, really good question. And then Bobby, uh, come on on the if you wanted to speak for sure. Yeah, no, I just want to say that was really cool. I knew the building was pretty awesome, but um, you know, I never really seen the ins and outs of it. So thank you, Barry and Rianne, for taking the time and kind of showing us the different things. I mean, obviously, I have a million questions now, but I'm not going to bore everybody with them. But because I'm local, uh, maybe when are you guys gonna. When do you think the building with COVID and everything, will the building open up for an actual on-site tour in the foreseeable future? What's your guys' stance on that? That's a good question. <laughs> we don't really know. I'm, I'm anticipating we probably won't be doing um, regular building tours in person until there's a vaccine. Okay. Um, but I can't say for sure. 
And so volunteer opportunities it. consist of being outside on the farm at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. We don't have anything in the building volunteer wise. Um, I mean, obviously using the bathrooms and um, whatever resources you need in here, but the work is all outdoors right now. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank for you sure. so much. Yeah, Andy. thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm really glad that you all could be with us today. It's just, it's such a joy to connect with people and kind of, yeah, work through the COVID restrictions. And I can't wait for you to see us in person. Um, yeah. We've got yeah. one more question from Aotunde. I hope I'm not messing okay. your name up because I hate when people do that to me. But um, wondering if the building is more like a community center. Um, and it's, we have kind of, um, a lot going on. We, we do like to connect and serve the community, but we are a okay. local farm market where um, we source from farmers who are growing in regenerative and sustainable ways. So we have a farm market um, that sells their produce to the community and um, or just other goods like honey, and pickles and cheese and meat and all this stuff. Um, so we have a market here and then we, when before COVID, we would absolutely host events and kind of serve as more of an educational center for people to, like-minded people to come together, learn about sustainability. Um, and that's what a lot of our building entails. In here, you can actually see this is a library. We have books on all different facets of sustainable living from gardening to cooking, to building, um, to making your own clothes, um, anything you can do to, save time and energy and resources are in here. <laughs> and then lastly, our farm, our campus is a pretty giant, 21 acres worth of uh, land just about. And we have a beautiful regenerative farm that takes up around 18 acres. And we we um, like to educate the community here, share in the joy of farming and, and restoration because restoration um, is one of the most viable solutions to climate change and climate action is creating those natural spaces again to reclaim a lot of the carbon and, and promote um, better systems within the, the, the ecosystem, I guess. Um, so yeah, there's, we have a volunteering, um, we have a volunteering initiative. We have a lot of beautiful volunteers that would come and help us out through the year um, to learn about what it would look like to be a regenerative farmer and also learn about um, the community at, and uh, how they can just get some farming yeah. and gardening skills. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, and then obviously during COVID, uh, we aren't having events, but we'd uh, host a lot of community events or you may have mentioned this already, but uh, especially for kind of partner organizations and other folks working on sustainability um, in the region uh, and bring in, trying to bring in uh, building professionals and talk about using the building as a living laboratory and um, talk about green building practices as much as we can when we're using the space. So yeah, thanks so much everyone um, for joining us. Uh, and I know it's, we're a little bit past time here. So I wanna give people the opportunity to head out if they need to. Um, and if there's uh, any yeah. more questions, I'm, I'm totally happy to, to answer. Yes, we'll, we're gonna send out a follow-up um, email with some resources, like maybe Barry's, Barry's or, or the 21 Acres contact info so you can reach out with um, specific questions. Sure, and, and you're welcome to reach out to me specifically as well if you want. We'll list your email too. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you yeah. so much, Bobby. Thanks so it's much nice for joining us. Have a good day. You too. Yeah, you too. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Great to see you, Hey Young, or hear you. See you. Talk to you later. I will send you an email. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, bye. Thanks for spending time with us, folks. All right. Well, I guess we'll end it. Okay. Much love. Yes, um, all right. Bye. Bye.